week 30 of Christian Ultra Libertarians for Truth, also known as Cult. And uh, there's been some kickback from that. It's kind of interesting just to let you know. Delaney tried to, to uh, put Cult on Google. It won't allow you to list Cult. It won't let you use the word for the location of what, where we do everything. It's kind of funny, isn't it? <coughs> <coughs> I told her they'll let you put topless bar, you know, uh, Junior's topless bar or whatever. I'm guessing they will, but they won't let you use that, uh, that word, even if it's tongue and cheek. A number of years ago, there was a man who came and he fellowshiped with us. He's a devout believer in the Lord, still is. He follows him in faith. He tries to be loving, a good guy. Of this, I have little doubt. But frankly, he's so devoted to the faith in, uh, that in, in the name of Jesus. He's so devoted to that that after studying with us for a while and are getting deep into uh, positions under why we believe like we do, my views and focus became a little too much for him. And he wanted to just do more... Uh, Jesus focus, just, just Jesus, just Jesus, just Jesus. And, and, and I understood that he's really sold out for that. And so we've remained friends over the years and we talk uh, on the phone about every four months and say hello. And uh, I, I try to do that with anybody who loves the Lord, just keep connections. But when he left, he made it clear that my views were the reason that he was leaving and that I was too theological in my approach to the scripture, and that, um, and I said, well, I think it's really important that we grow, and that we grow in our wisdom and knowledge, and we don't remain at a certain level of where we entered into the faith, and that's why the writer of Hebrews, which you know, in chapter five, he says, I wanted to teach you about Melchizedek, but I wasn't able because you only like to drink the milk of the word. And he said, you should be eating the meat of the word. And then he goes on in chapter six and he says, therefore, leaving the principles, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. That means completion. Let's learn. Let's grow. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. That means the law and of faith toward God. He said, don't keep. Don't keep relaying the foundation of faith toward God, of doctrine, of baptisms, of laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Don't keep laying that stuff. Go on and grow in your maturity. And then he instructs his reader that this is possible if God will allow it in their lives. So the thinking is not to abandon the, the foundational teachings of Jesus and, and his resurrection and, and eternal life and repentance and faith and all of that. It's not to abandon it. It's to see it as our foundation and to build upon it. As we grow and, and as you build upon a foundation, you rise higher and you can see more is the objective, right? So the writer of Hebrews is actually critical of Christian milk drinkers. And, uh, and he's that way in the chapter before. So a number of years have passed since that brother was here and left, maybe five or six, and I was contemplating all that we have discovered in our verse-by-verse -verse analysis of the scripture. And when I say discovered, I mean discovered within the context of scripture. Not me being some guru sitting on a mountaintop receiving revelation and coming up with new stuff. This is contextual stuff that has been mined from the scripture and that has brought new understanding as we have proceeded forward in a dedication to verse-by-verse -verse teaching through looking at original languages, looking at context, looking at things related to whatever we're discussing. So the importance of the resurrection was one of those things. Cannot be overstated in the Christian walk how valuable the resurrection is. What, and I don't mean just the resurrection of Christ. I mean the promised resurrection of everybody who dies, right? The resurrection is supremely important as a topic. And 
so, and it bears some profound implications on how a person chooses to live their life. Profound. So in my estimation, there are a few things less understood in the faith. However, maybe eschatology is understood less. And therefore, the arduous study of the resurrection is not of great interest to people because it's so difficult to really get your hands around. And, and it just remains in an area of, yeah, okay, it's out there. I really don't know any of the intricate answers to it, but it's there. So for some reason, as I contemplated, all that we've come to understand, hopefully by the spirit and a contextual analysis of the scripture, of the resurrection, uh, I began to sort of summarize what those things are. And I thought in my mind, well, it's a spiritual body. Right then and there, it's a spiritual body. That which is laid in the ground, it, Paul likens to a seed. That which rises up in the resurrection is likened to a corn stalk or a flower or a tree. How much, how much relation does the tree have to the seed in terms of how it looks? It doesn't. Completely different. So the resurrected body is a completely different model. It's like comparing a toy Tonka truck to a spaceship that's gone to Mars. Extremely different things, right? And the, and the major difference is it's spiritual. It's not the physical that goes in the grave. You read 1 Corinthians 15, you discover these things. The resurrection's been ongoing since Christ returned for his bride at the death of each person. Every time someone dies, that resurrection is in place. It's awarded, it's given to the just and the unjust. It's given to all souls. It varies in glory. That some people, their die, their seed goes in the ground and it raises up a little tiny weed. And some people die and they raise up a giant redwood. Difference in glory is something that we learned contextually studying the resurrection. It's bestowed upon everybody by God. He looks at the de deceased and he says, this is the resurrected body you're going to get. And it was only after Jesus' resurrection that he was called God by his, uh, he was called by God, excuse me, his only begotten. And that it was after his resurrection that Jesus, the human man of Nazareth, became Jesus, God in the flesh, in the flesh, okay? And that his resurrection was physical to show that he had overcome death for his people then. If it had been spiritual, if it had been, if his resurrection had been as different as a seed to a redwood, they wouldn't have known it was him. So we know that his resurrection is based in that physicality so he could show the, the prince in his hands and in his side. And they could see that it literally was the one who was on the cross who died. But because he did that does not have application to the rest of us, which is what many people mistake. The scripture also, there's two more things, describes some resurrections as better than others. It's like one's a weed, one's a flower, one's a plant, one's a redwood, right? They are different. And then finally, Paul uses a word only used once in all of the Bible. And he says, yeah, there's a resurrection of the just and the unjust, Anastasius of the just, Anastasius of the unjust, but I am doing anything possible to get the ex-Anastasis. And what that means is I want to have a resurrection that is outside the norm. I don't just want to go from my body, a seed being planted, 
to rising up to be a weed or a flower or a, a pine tree or a redwood. I want my body to be outside all of that. I want it to be a freaking rocket ship by comparison. Okay? Those are some of the principal things the scripture clearly decides and defines for us about the resurrection. So, in the midst of all these things that the scripture conveys, I, for some reason, wondered. I wonder what my brother, who didn't like to study with us, who thought we were being too theological, thinks, at this point, six years gone by, of the resurrection. Where, where's he at relative to the subject? So, I called him. Now, understand this. I don't say this because I think I'm the source of all truth or light and that his insights are lesser than mine. He has his insights. That's up between him and God. And I'm not saying that this proves him to be a lesser Christian than me. His faith might make him far more of a believer than I am. Okay? It's just, uh, and I'm not saying that I'm correct in all my views, it's just to show how a, a, a confirmed study, a contextual study outside tradition, but a dedicated study to understand these things that the writer of Hebrews says we should go on to is indicative of the maturity of a believer. That's all. Not a judgment. Just the indicativeness of the maturity. So I called him. And remember, we're friends and brothers in terms of the faith. And so uh, I'm sure I look like an infidel uh, to God by comparison to this man in terms of his faith, right? He, that I, I made clear. So right out the gate, he answers, hello, my brother. And I say, hey, what's going on? I said, tell me, what do you think of the resurrection? Now, he knows I go into all sorts of things. So he was probably being a little bit defensive. And he said, I believe I will be resurrected. I said, okay. He says, whether my body comes out of the grave or not, I don't know. But uh, I will have a tangible body that identifies me as a person in heaven. I said, oh, excellent. I said, anything else? He said, no, I think that's about it. I said, Will everybody be resurrected? Now remember, Jesus said there's a resurrection of the just and the unjust. All will be resurrected. He said, it's funny, but I personally believe that only believers are resurrected. And the rest will cease to exist. Okay, now this is his point of view, his doctrine, love him, not going to correct him or debate him. But that's what he said. Absolutely contrary to the biblical narrative. Everybody continues to exist according to the biblical narrative. But he, this is his belief. I didn't challenge it. I just listened to him. Additionally, my mind jumped out to the creation of souls and God giving free will and God being love, which is patient, kind. I gave thought as after he said that to the notions of a God being predestinational of creating and then there being those who would be saved, which he knew about. And all of that's going through my mind when he said, yeah, I believe they just don't exist. So what his answer did was it made me see that there is an implication against God in that that's pretty horrific. But I didn't say that to him because, again, he believes what he wants to believe. I said, I got it. I said, anything else about the resurrection? He knew I was asking, but I wasn't challenging. And I gave him the, the, the chance to talk. He said, nope. And I decided to prompt at this point a little bit. And I said, any thoughts on the type of resurrection that there will be for the believers, you believe will receive it. I just told you what the scripture really does indicate. 
He said, well, I don't know if there's levels. He, uh, he said, or, or kingdoms, you know, because of the Mormons' view of kingdoms. Uh, but that's about it. He kind of reiterated again, that's about it. He was telling me I'm keeping it simple. He was telling me I don't care about anything that's meaty. And we ended our conversation uh, as uh, I, something came up in my current life and I had to go. Does it matter that my brother walks by this faith and is not interested in seeking more information more deeply? I would say it does, and I would say it doesn't. It certainly doesn't matter since he is adopted into the household of God by faith and becomes a child of God. Child in the Greek is a certain word. And so he becomes a child by faith. Um, but I can't help but wonder, I just wonder, if his walk would be enriched and he would grow and mature on the meat of the word and become a new Greek word, a son. Huios. There's a difference in scripture between the children of God and sons and daughters. There's a difference. I believe that that's played out both in the resurrection we receive and our proximity to God in the afterlife as a result of the body that we inhabit eternally. I'm just saying that's what I see. I don't know that to be a fact. If it's just based on faith, then, uh, then, then fine, you know, we might all just be the same. It's one heaven. We're all equal. Everybody gets the same resurrected body, including Paul, and that's it. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture predicates the resurrection on the works we do here. And I think an understanding of that will help us as we seek for a better resurrection. It's like the idea of end times. If I have heard one person say, I've heard 10,000 people say, it doesn't really matter either way. That's what they say. I've even said it recently because the world is such a disaster. I've said, you know, I don't believe Jesus is coming back, but man, this world seems like it's going to end. Right? It doesn't matter either way. But everything matters in our understanding of it, in what we accept as truth, and then how we respond to the truths that we've embraced. And eschatology really matters if you want to understand both the Father in, in truth and in spirit, and if you want to walk accordingly. Admittedly, there are souls who study themselves right out of the faith and uh, who become so academic <clears throat> that the simple principles of the faith are lost. Uh, caution, humility, always as we study, right? But when Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well, the hour comes and now is that when true, the true worshipers, the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. It seems to me that the pursuit of truth by the Spirit is really important relative to who we are, what we do, and maybe even the resurrection to come. I can't help but wonder about the value and the importance of seeking when the true worshipers seek the Father in spirit and truth. Not seeking and never coming to a knowledge of the truth, but seeking as a means to build upon the sacred foundational truths that we embrace, all as a means to pursue and worship him more deeply. For whatever it's worth, love you.